Um, first of all, I am very pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Joe Kennedy, who works for the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, but based in Sussex. Um, Joe lectures in English and Cultural Studies on its programme at the University of Sussex in Brighton. He has written two books, one on football and one on the cultural and political construction of authenticity in contemporary Britain, and is working on a third about transport and the romance of infrastructure. His academic work covers many aspects of 20th and 21st century British fiction. And um, this afternoon, Joe is going to present for us on the topic of Scottishness and the Nordic in the interwar thriller. Joe, over to you. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm just going to quickly apologise quite profusely to everybody else that I have to rush away after I've given this talk. So I will be disappearing once I've spoken. So I'm sorry for the lack of collegiality there, but I have childcare to do. Um, uh, so I will just share my screen so I can get um, my slides on if I can. Is that okay? Can we see that? Yes, I think so. Um, and if anybody wants to send any questions, my email address is down at the bottom. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so Scottishness and the Nordic in the interwar thriller. So if one consults Scotland's future, the 700 page document unleashed by the Scottish government in advance of the 2014 independence referendum, they will find its secessionist positivity girded by frequent petitions to a commonality with not only the country's near neighbours, Denmark and Norway, but also with Sweden and Finland. Enmeshed in this primarily economistic appeal is a sense that Scotland does not merely share a Nordic tendency towards social democratic consensus, which distinguishes it from its inveterately laissez-faire southern partner in the Union, but that, it, but that it is more culturally alike to the Scandinavian countries, Finland and Iceland, than it is to England. Scotland's future repeatedly uses phrases such as nations similar to Scotland and comparable nations, always mentioning in such constructions at least one of the Nordic countries, but usually more and occasionally a full sweep. This is a typical extract. Nations that are similar to Scotland, such as Norway, Finland, Denmark and Sweden, sit at the top of world wealth and well-being league tables. Unlike Scotland, they are independent and able to take decisions in the best interests of their own economies. That is their independence advantage, and they have used it to build societies that deliver a, far, a higher quality of life for their citizens. While it is possible to read this passage and others like it as restraining itself to pragmatic socioeconomic justifications for making an association between Scotland and the Nordics, there is also a poorly hidden invitation to regard such comparisons as involving something beyond policy. If Norway, Finland, Denmark and Sweden are indeed nations that are similar to Scotland but operate in an economically distinct way because of their independence, and of course, what are these nations independent from if not one another, then in what way can they said to be said to be similar? Population might offer feasible cause for comparison, but Scotland's five and a half million inhabitants Give it the likeness not only of Norway and Finland, but also of Slovakia, the Republic of Congo and Singapore. Sweden, of course, is twice Scotland's size at the last headcount. Other similarities might be based on certain forms of resource wealth, such as oil or forestry, but Sweden is famously bereft of fossil fuels, and Denmark, while growing its forests, is largely open farmland. At some point, these commonalities shade into the fuzzy abstraction of cultural kinship, of the sort embodied by Ian Rankin's claim that their Scottish sensibility, psychology, psyche is very close to Scandinavia. Nordicizations of Scotland seem to occur around moments of heightened nationalist consciousness, and it is ultimately an earlier one of these that I want to talk about. In various cases since the early part of last century, however, a common thread is that going into the North, as a 1997 editorial in the Edinburgh Review put it, might permit Scotland to escape the dichotomy which has often been argued to constitute its identity. Undoubtedly, we're all aware of the Caledonian anti-syzygy, G. Gregory Smith, and later and more famously Hugh McDermott's hypothesis that Scottishness is not split into, but instead is defined by being the split itself between Highland and Lowland, 
Celtic Gaelic and Germanic Scots, Catholicism, Presbyterianism, Romanticism and Realism, and so on. For McDermott, this was an opportunity representative of a dynamism and pliability that can make identification tactical rather than essential. For others, the antisyzygy has instead re represented paralysis, indecision, and a fatalism about Scotland's inability to define itself. Going into the North then, perhaps offers itself as a third term, which does not reconcile itself to the antisyzygy. Scotland need not play up its similarities either with Ireland or into the, or those it shares with England either, because in such an analysis, its real cultural cousins lie not across the North Channel or Hadrian's Wall, but the North Sea. Clearly, there are many areas of Scotland and especially its insular peripheries where there is some truth in this and there have been numerous writers who have lent into it. The longer version of this paper, for example, talks about Eric Linklater, whose pastiche saga, The Men of Ness, is set in the Orkneys. Linklater stood as a National Party of Scotland candidate the year after Macdermott argued for a kind of tactical Celticism in the Caledonian anti-syzygy, but as Liam McIlvaney puts it, saw himself as, quote, a surly, hard-nosed Norseman casting a cold eye on his Celtic contemporaries and could be argued to have offered an alternative mythopoetics of independence. However, it isn't to the nationalist Linklater, but to the notionally unionist John Buchan that the rest of this discussion turns, because I want to think about how his thriller, The Island of Sheep, which is from the mid thirties and I managed to not include a year for it, um, both invites and problematizes a cartography which situates Scotland as Nordic. The Island of Sheep constitutes the last part of the last of Buchan's pentalogy of novels narrated by Richard Hannay, a Scottish born mining engineer who returns to Britain from South Africa in the lead up to World War I. In the sequence's first three installments, the justly renowned 39 Steps from 1915, Green Mantle from 1916, and Mr. Stanfast from 1919, Hannay's chance entanglement in a spy conspiracy and his subsequent rise to the status of a patriotic war hero are detailed while well, three hostages of 1924 sees him foil a kidnapping plot. Hannay also narrates the introduction to the Courts of the Morning from 1929, which focuses on the adventures of several of his most significant associates introduced in the preceding novels, and introduces Jacques d'Angreville, who returns as the principal antagonist of the Island of Sheep. As the Courts of the Morning is not a canonical Hannay novel, because he is merely its curator, thus producing a more than decade-long gap between instalments in the sequence, and because the stories tend more or less to be set close to their date of publication, The Island of Sheep has the ambience of an afterthought, and its once almost youthful hero is virtually pensionable. Indeed, the setup for the plot is a nostalgic flashback to an episode in Hannay's former life in Rhodesia, in which he and several friends rescue an eccentric Danish treasure hunter, Marius Haraldsson, from a gang who intends to rob him in the wilderness, in the aftermath of a business disagreement. In a burning kraal, Haraldson, evoking saga mythology, insists on a pact by which Hane and his friend Lombard will come to his or his family's aid if they are ever again threatened by the gang. In the novel's interwar present, Hane coincidentally encounters Lombard, now settled and tedious on a train in the English stockbroker belt, then again coincidentally, Haraldson's more retiring son in an inn in Norfolk. Soon, the younger Haraldson contacts Hannay to request his protection against gangsters connected to the Rhodesian episode. Hannay elicits the support of a reluctant Lombard and, of course, of Sandy Arbuthnot, his usual sidekick. Initially, they sequester Haraldson and his daughter Anna at Arbuthnot's ancestral seat in the Scottish borders, but soon decide to fight a concluding battle at their charge, on their charges island in the Norlands, which are clearly based on the Faroe Islands, but never named as such. At the end of the novel, the once timid younger Haraldson, imitating the Norlanders who kill three Viking raiders in a folk tale he tells Hannay shortly after their arrival on the island, hurls de Angreville from a cliff. The rest of the miscreants surrender when Anna, Haraldson's teenage daughter, leads, quote, an army of men outside all Hannay's notions of humanity in troll like Norland dress, recruited from a whale hunt against them. Two preliminary points need making about the Island of Sheep's cartography. The first is that the, novel's, the novel is longitudinally inexorable, plotting a northwards course almost relentlessly. There are four main settings. Late Victorian Rhodesia, 
Panay's home Foss in the Cotswolds, Arbuthnot's Labour Law in the Scottish Borders, and the titular Island, and they appear in that order. The transition from Foss to Labour Law is encapsulated in the novel's memorable set piece, in which Lombard rediscovers his youthful bravado to spirit Anna to Scotland in a tense, drawn out episode, uh, escape, escapade along the North, Great North Road. Panay and Lombard's boat journey from Scotland to the Norlands is also depicted in detail. <laughs> These are movements readers are supposed to pay attention to. On one hand, the Northwoods drift might seem to be anticipatorily tracing imperial withdrawal. We are told that the younger Lombard had dedicated himself to one end, the building up of a British Equatoria, a new kingdom of Prester John. But by the time Hannay re-encounters him, he is the picture of overcomfortable bourgeois sedentariness. Yet the island of sheep overshoots not only the Scott Hannay's adopted England in favour of labour law, but goes on to pull its narrator and Lombard further into the north. If this is imperial withdrawal and homecoming, it is so as a sort of crash landing beyond the apparent purview either of Britishness or Scottishness. The second piece of immediately significant cartography in the island of sheep is that the place that the writing eventually lands upon is not what, following the geocritic Derek Schilling, we might call a properly geo-actual space, but a dwindling echo of one. Buchan had travelled in the Faroes shortly before writing the novel, and there is no doubt at all that the Norlands are based on them, especially in the adaptation of the real island's capital, Torshavn, a Shalmashavn, a winking nod to a hero of the Faroese sagas. Yet the choice to forsake geoactuality is pointed, not least in the decision to trade the semantically ambiguous pharaohs for the blunter Norlands, which announces almost aggressively that this is a northern Nordic space. The move at first pass trims the cultural and historical specificity of the pharaohs down to a generic synecdoche of the Nordic on behalf of an Anglophone audience in search of the cold exotic. Indeed, the novel thematizes that thematizes the pan-Scandinavian or Nordist outlook early on when Arbuthnot and Hane reminisce about the older Haraldson. Haraldson's missions in Africa and further afield as a professional gold seeker were, the reader learned, designed to fund a sort of northern renaissance of which he would be the leader. As Sandy explains to Hane, his youth was before the days of all this Nordic humbug, but he had a vision of a great northern revival when the spirit of Harold Fairhair would revive in Norway and Gustavus Adolphus and Charles XII would be reborn in Sweden and Valdemar the Victorious in Denmark. Sandy's account of Haraldson's ambitions is tinged with ambivalence, echoing Hannay's retrospective examination of Lombard's empire-building aspirations in the novel's first chapter. Both present cartographic fantasies of the late 19th century, Pan-Nordism, Rhodes-Ian, imperial expansionism, as relatively, relatively innocent when compared to the fascistic Aryanism, Aryanism of what Sandy euphemistically calls this Nordic humbug, but they are also set up as childishly romantic. Lombard's very young man's talk has fire and poetry in it, but is, is ultimately marred by what Hane sees as its crudity, the older Haraldson was, according to Sandy, principally a poet, and the tone of Arbuthnot's sketch is softly chiding. But Mariah's Haraldson's vision is at best chaotic, is made obvious when his son dines with Hane and details what has passed since the episode in Southern Africa. The old man's ambition for his son seems to have been a kind of blend of Sir Walter Scott and Bismarck or and Cecil Rhodes. Of course, it didn't work. That kind of scheme never does. He went to Den college in Denmark in Germany. He did two years in a Copenhagen bank. He travelled from Greenland in the west to the White Sea in the east and even got as far as Spitsbergen. And there were not many places in Scandinavia and its islands on which he had not turned his unseeing eyes. But he did it all as a round of duty, for he had not a spark of his father's ardour. Buchan seemingly employs both Hane and Sandy's clubbish irony to jack up attention internal to the novel between the generic Scandina Scandinavianism or Nordism connoted by the paling of the real-life pharaohs into the Norlands and the absurdity of grandiose homogenizing eth ethno-projects. As Christopher Harvey shows, Buchan was on the surface an imperialist and a unionist, but close reading of his fiction, especially elements of the Hane sequence, may reveal, quote, an other, Scottish nationalist persona, drawn to locality and particularity, sceptical at times of the abstractions of the supranational. 
In the light of this scepticism, the Norlands resemble a layered joke which merges Anglophone fantasies about the Nordic with the Nordic's most grandiose fantasies about itself, only for this chimera to be confounded by the specifics of place. Conspicuously, the invaders killed by the Norlanders in Haraldson's folktale are themselves Norse, and when Anna rallies the whale hunters to her family's defence, she strikes a note which reverberated through all their traditions, the note of peril from strangers, Norse and Scots rovers, Algerian pirates. The Norse, emblematic of Nordic history to the casual observer, are as alien and unfitting as not only Scots, but the much more far-travelling Algerian pirates in this location, which initially seems to be archetypical for them. The Island of Sheep then raises the issue of a gap between the simplifications involved in revivalist romantic ethnologies and the awkwardness of empirical encounters with the spaces and people they, the peoples they intend to incorporate. Even Haraldson's late conversion to what he what resembles a berserker archetype, which the text teases us into thinking that it thinks might be racial memory, the shocked Sandy claims that the Dane, quote, reverted to type for a little while, is marked out as a self-conscious and rather literary act by Hannay's interpolated summary of the Norland folktale in his depiction of Dan Reveal's death. Douglas Kerr's analysis of the scene claims it is enacted, it, quote, enacted in a thoroughgoing Nordic atavism, evidence of something like a racial unconscious. But I wonder if this reading is not a little flattening. Haraldson, I think, is acting out the idea of an intrinsic racial spirit by raising himself up to a legend whose finer points, in fact, imply the interrogation of such an idea. Subsequently, Panay's vignette of the mustard whalers who have, like Haraldson, gone back to type they were their forebears of a thousand years ago, reads as an ironization of the idea of type, as the ambiguous relation of the Norlands to the Nordic, are the Norlanders Nordic or Norse or simply irreducibly Norlandic, is again quietly raised. When Hane surveys the Norland, he does so as a Scot, and there are instances in the text when Hane maps the island using a Scottish gazetteer. Passing Halder, the second biggest of the Norlands, which is probably Eisteroy and the Pharaohs, he remarks on how its shoreline is, quote, marvellously corrugated, Deep cut glens running down from peaks about 3,000 feet in height. And on Haraldson's Island, he swat spots swampy locks, which looked as if they might furnish difficult fishing. Of course, both glen and lock are Scottish, and what's more, Scots Gaelic geonyms. And it is notable that it is in the Norlands that Hannay, a Scot by birth, but not an inhabitant of Scotland for most of his life, should slip into this register. He interprets the Nordic through the Scottish, but it is also in the Nordic that he becomes discernibly Scottish, as he, in his aside that the island, quote, reminded me of Colonsay, Colonsay on the top picture there, um, Kalsoy in the pharaohs on the bottom, reminded me of Colonsay, a low green place cradled deep in the sea. Colonsay is one of the, at the time of the publication, the island of sheep, culturally Gaelic Hebrides of Scotland's west coast, halfway between the two much more well-known islands of Isla and Mull. It is a comparative illusion, obscure enough, to suggest that it is targeted specifically at the Scottish reader. Yet, as if to complete the circle, Colonsay is of Norse rather than Gaelic etymology. In addition to Hannay's almost unconscious linguistic and similetic registration of the Scottishness of the Norlands and thus the Norlandic qualities of Scotland, the earlier scenes at Lavalor, when the novel ramps up its great northwards push, also offer grounds for thinking Buchan was inverting Scotland into Nordic cartographies. It is here that Haraldson begins to recover from his anxieties about, about the machinations of the gang who seek to ruin him, and where Hane notes that his friend's eyes have acquired, quote, the pale blue fanaticism of the North. At one point, Haraldson, traipsing over the hills to attend a village wedding with Hane, declares with abstracted eyes that this place is like the Norlands. I have smelled this smell at midsummer there when there was a wind from the hills. Later, in the same sequence, the group witness a fight between farm dogs at the close of the festivities, a seemingly mundane occurrence, which makes Haraldson think of Sama, the dog who, quote, died with Gunnar, Gunnar of Livend, and reminds him of what he had forgotten. It is this which makes him decide to return to fight a decisive battle on the island, emphasising Haraldson's distance from home as emblematised in his desire to return, but also denoting a profound yet obscured link between disparate points on the map. 
one can smell the Norlands in Scotland and encounter the distant echoes of Norse myth. And when one gets to the Norlands, they find a miniature Scotland, at least in Hannay's case. Yet, as we have seen, the idea of the Nordic that Buchan seems via Hannay to be submitting Scotland for inclusion within is one which the novel is constantly at pains to problematize. At its worst, this Nordic humbug, it is national socialist ideology in more benign forms, which despite Sandy's not entirely convincing defense of Marius Haraldson are in inevitably vulnerable to the requirements of chauvinistic logics themselves. It is romantic abstraction. The Nordic is shown repeatedly to be a literary production rather than a natural fact. And the location used as its allegorical emblem is in any case, the site of a mythologized history of resistance to the Norse. The Island of Sheep, published only a couple of years after McDermott's famous tract on the Scottish crisis of identity, toys with the idea of a third way, neither Gaelic nor Scots, but Nordic, while all the time hinting at the contingency of such a solution. At the end of the novel, the proneness of the Nordic idea to projection is disclosed in a passage which transforms the island into a sort of Valhalla of the subjective. Now that the nightmare had gone, the island seemed a happy place. To me, it was Foss, and to Sandy, it was labor law, but both, so to speak, set in a world of new dimensions. To Lombard, the man who I had once thought of as degenerated into a sleek mediocrity, it was a revelation. It had brought back something of his youth and his youth youth's dreams. Marius Haraldson's bastion of the Northern Revival is, in the final account, overgeneralized into a crude Hanean metaphor for the sheer singularity of any given image of a home. Despite the superficial invitations, the novel offers its reader to participate in a racialized essentialism which might yet make room for Scotland. The Island of Sheep might, and I think could inst should instead be read as pursuing such an essentialism into the corner of an absolute atomized modularity which renders identitarian obsessions with the true nature of a nation, as in fact beside the point. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not really sure what the questioning format is, but um, if I can have some, that'd be great. Thank you. I'll just unshare there as well. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Um, that was a fascinating talk. Um, the consumer exploration of uh, a group of literature and its implications and interpretations. I think I learned quite a lot. Um, I don't see any questions just yet, but while people get round to typing things in, maybe I've got one for you. What you say um, to me sounds like a perfectly reasonable interpretation of work that was written 30, 40 years ago. Would you say things have changed in the period since? to reflect maybe more recent political developments? Well, in, in terms of the um, kind of more recent uh, Scottish noir and, and Scandinavian yes. noir. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 to be honest, I'm going to, like, this is a total cowardly answer. I don't feel like I have the familiarity with the current kind of developments in noir literature. I see this as a kind of prehistory to the questions that are maybe being asked in, the, in this conference. Um, I, I, I would really struggle to answer that one. I think. Well, that's but, that's good enough. Um, as not a, an enormous consumer of contemporary noir from from anywhere, I think I think Ian Rankin is probably as far as I, I have been with um with this kind of literature. And I certainly haven't, to my shame, I haven't read much Scandinavian noir writing either. Um, but I do think it's interesting that you you know whether it's the nineteen thirties with people like Linklater, and maybe to some extent Buchan, but problematized here. Or whether it's you know the last ten years, there is the or in the nineteen nineties as well, there is this appeal that that kind of Scottish nationalism seems to make to Scandinavia as a as a kind of way out of what seems to be a kind of intellectual trap to some degree. Um, so it do, it does seem to be a kind of recurring thing. Yeah, I something I wonder about is the works you've talked about are from a long time ago when mm -hmm. the the issue of independence was not a politically live issue and therefore yeah. the authors perhaps had more space to explore their cultural and intellectual yeah. relationship with it. Whereas over the past 10 years, it has been a live and prominent political issue 
And that means surely that the current generation of authors will have been exposed to the concepts in a much more immediate and visceral way. And like mm. yourself, I haven't read enough literature from this particular period to comment, but I wonder if it somehow changed the way that the ideas are problematized and presented. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly like to, to know more about that. I would be kind of tr trying to chase up any papers that come out of this conference, even if I have to dash off. Thanks. Do we have in the, the audience any questions for Joe? Ian has his hand up. Ian. I, I can't I can't use the, the, the QA widget as I'm the host, so I have to raise my hand. Um, I was I was wondering because your 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 day job's quite an interesting one, Joe, in that you look after students from the University of Gothenburg who come to Sussex. And I wondered um uh, whether the connections between uh, British more widely literature and Swedish literature are things that they reflect on in their own work and studies when they come to you. As, are you seeing those connections brought forward? I think that I, I do. That I've, I've done almost through kind of student, I, I wouldn't say pressure, but kind of student interest is that I've, I've changed a lot of my teaching around in the last couple of years to, to, to almost curate my... Um, certainly my introductory literature courses to things that the students will be really interested in. You, you think, why have they come to England? They're going to find about um, British stuff. And I've put Sherlock Holmes on to uh, create a detective fiction module when we do Sherlock Holmes. Um, and there is, as I'm sure you know, this kind of real fascination of a kind of high level consumption for sort of post Sherlock Holmes whodunit crime in in Sweden, particularly. I can't speak for the the other um scandinavian and nordic countries but bbc sends so much kind of cozy crime to sweden and of course the sort of what comes back in the other direction is the, the deeply uncozy crime uh, and we talk about this a lot we find that like the, the um my students find it very funny that there is this kind of obsession almost with um with scandinavian noir fiction um and uh and in turn you know there's not a lack of interest in it in Sweden, but it, there is also this very high level consumption of the opposite kind of crime fiction. So that's the thing we talk about. Um, but just um, looking at, at this question, booking period, very, thank you, Peter, very much reflects adventure moving from rural Scotland, whereas contemporary authors move out of cities into rural. Why do we think this major change has come about? Well, um, okay, kind of, contemporary interest in the pastoral is one thing i think and, and also in what i'd call the, the dark pastoral i don't think that's necessarily limited to scotland um i think it is a, a very widespread phenomenon in in british literature at the moment so it's something i've have written about here and there actually this um uh idea that the kind of getting out of the city into into the rural and often to explore the so-called darkness of the rural or a, a term that I don't really love, but we'll use anyway now, a kind of folk horror, um, kind of offers a greater level of authenticity. It's certainly, this, I think, this kind of post or, or Brexit era thing where authors feel like they have to explore the voices of people who are not metropolitan. Um, that might be one explanation for it, Peter, I think. We have one last question. Um, Thank you, Alan. It's from David uh, David Giles, and well, it's an observation really. David says, uh, the Buchan novel which exemplifies Buchan's Scottishness to me is Witch mm. Wood. Yeah. And it seems much more like Stevenson or Scott than most of his other novels, but I mm. suppose it's not real noir. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I haven't read Witch Wood. Uh, it's been on my list of things to read. And of course, it's something that I think makes a, a lot of sense to kind of um, come in here. I, I do find that link between Stevenson and Buchan really interesting like that there is a kind of big thread of DNA kind of going going through there um so I will will chase that up um the the Pane novels I have you know the, the they're the book that I know um and that I've read so many times since I was I don't know 11 or 12 years old um so that um, this paper was a bit of a pet project to be honest I, I have always loved the island of sheep I don't know why uh, and I wanted to write a paper where I could kind of think about what, trying to think, figure out what I thought was interesting about it. Um, but maybe kind of broadening out into some other stuff and booking would be would be quite interesting. Uh, thank you for that, um, David. 
Thank you very much, Joe. OK, um, I think that's now time to thank Joe. Everybody, if you could do so virtually, we can hand clap with an icon. I'm doing it in real life. There we are. Uh, thank uh, you very much, everyone. Um, uh, lovely to meet you all. And please, if you've got any ob observations or questions, send me send me a, an email. Um, I'm going to leave now, but thank you very much for having me, Ian, and Alan, and everybody else. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was fantastic. Cheers. Lovely. Enjoy the rest thank of your you. day. You too.